Hey everyone, Dr. Jack Audie, and in this video, I'm going to be breaking down some research that I was involved in. Uh, this research was mostly done by Michael Daniels, um, and it was done in the David Broff and Catherine Lawrence Research Group at the University of Manchester. Now, in the previous few videos, I've sort of been building up to this paper. I've been explaining the theoretical background behind this paper, as well as some of the techniques that go into this paper. And then in the next few videos, I'm really going to thoroughly break down this paper. So the title of the paper is Phenomate NSAIDs Inhibit the NLRP3 Inflammasome and Protect Against Alzheimer's Disease in Rodent Models. If all of that is gibberish, please go back and watch the previous videos, because you should, just from the title, know where this is going. So let's jump into it. First, I just want to quickly skim over some of the essential background for the paper. How did we come up with this hypothesis um, and why did we essentially pursue this research in the first place? So first up, yes, neuroinflammation is happening during this form of dementia known as Alzheimer's disease in which you get memory deficits followed by cognitive deficits, language deficits, and eventually motor deficits and death. Now we can track neuroinflammation in the brain using PET imaging, um, which we put a radio labeled tag into the bloodstream and it binds to a specific thing that we wanted to bind to. And in this case, we're binding it to activated microglia. So here we can see in an Alzheimer's brain, we've got activated microglia, we've got inflammation, whereas in a healthy control brain, we do not have inflammation going on. Now this inflammation is mostly clustered in little zones around the brain and in Alzheimer's disease it's clustered around amyloid plaques. So in green here we have the amyloid plaque and in red we have these activated inflamed microglia. In yellow you can see little chunks of amyloid being eaten by the microglia. Now, we know that this activates the microglia and causes inflammation, but one of the weird questions is when it comes to sort of fibrillar amyloid, what receptor could it be working through? Because it's not very soluble. And the answer is it's this uh, receptor complex that sits in your cytosol called the NLRP3 inflammasome. Now here it is here, it's absolutely beautiful, and what NLRP3 does is it activates when there's a perturbation in the cytosolic fluid, and it causes the release of mature active interleukin-1-beta. Here's interleukin-1-beta nestled into the interleukin-1-beta receptor, it's a very inflammatory cytokine. Now, we know that this pathway is involved in Alzheimer's disease. This is a very complicated image, but I do do a step-by-step -step breakdown in a previous video. But essentially here we can see amyloid, which is um, various amyloid species, which is one of the quintessential markers of Alzheimer's disease. We have monomers, oligomers, and fibrils. They all contribute to this uh, NLRP3 pathway. We get activation of TLR4 and TLR6 receptors to cause the expression of pro IL1 and the expression of NLRP3. Then we get frustrated phagocytosis. This is a lysis of the phagolysosome, which ultimately causes potassium and chloride efflux, which activates the inflammasome. The inflammasome then activates caspase 1 that cleaves pro interleukin 1 beta into the mature into leukin 1 beta which is then released and we end up with inflammation going on. Previous research which I've touched on is those signaling molecules into leukin 1 beta can lead to neutrophil infiltration and activation causing production of toxic chemicals such as bleach in your brain which you can imagine if that's occurring for 20 years um, um, between your 50s and 70s that's going to start to cause cognitive deficits through neuronal death. Okay, so then there was this very seminal paper by Henneke um, coming out of the Gollenbach group. Uh, well, very talented lab, produced some huge papers. Um, and in this paper, they crossed an NLRP3 knockout mouse, a mouse with no NLRP3 receptors in them, with an Alzheimer's mouse. And after two generations, you can end up with wild-type mice, NLRP3 knockout mice, AP, uh, Alzheimer's mice, and Alzheimer's mice with an NLRP3 knockout. They then looked at their memory using the Morris water maze. So here we can see, and I've explained this all previously, which is why I'm zipping through it. Here we can see that wild-type mice can be trained to find a, a, a location of a platform in a swimming pool. So the dotted line is the trace of a mouse swimming in a pool, and they can find where that platform is. They can be trained over several days. An Alzheimer's mouse cannot remember the training that it's had for the previous five days, so it cannot find that platform, and it just swims round and round in circles. However, an Alzheimer's mouse with an NLRP3 knockout, so they cannot induce that inflammatory response to the amyloid pathology that's going on in their brain, they are protected from these memory deficits and they can remember where the platform is. 
So all of this background, this, this concept that we now know that inflammation is going on in Alzheimer's disease, it can predict how fast your cognitive decline is, it's mediated by the NLRP3 receptor, leads to this central hypothesis. Factors which influence NLRP3 activity and subsequent interleukin one beta secretion will affect Alzheimer's disease progression. Now, for about five years of my life, I researched this um, from a couple of different angles. One was, can we inhibit NLRP3 as a therapeutic target? Target for Alzheimer's disease, and are there environmental factors that can sensitize NLRP3 that accelerates Alzheimer's disease? Now, this paper that I did with Michael Daniels and David Broff and Catherine Lawrence um, and a number of other collaborators really focused on this hypothesis. Can we inhibit NLRP3 as a therapy for Alzheimer's disease? And this is what I'm going to jump into over the next few videos. So first up, let's jump into this paper. What did we do? Well, what we actually did was, as part of a little bit of a broader project, we screened a whole bunch of existing drugs that are out there currently used um, in the clinic and uh, in the pharmacy to see if any of them inhibit NLRP3. Um, and so one of the advantages of this is that it means that we know the safety profile, we know if it can be given to 80-year-olds nice and effectively, and you have a bit more of a streamlined pathway to clinical relevance compared to trying to develop a brand new one and then finding out perhaps it's toxic for the liver if we tried to develop a brand new one. Maybe we would get these unwanted side effects. So we wanted to see if existing safe drugs could inhibit the NLRP3 inflammasome. And we actually looked at a whole bunch of different classes, like I can see tricyclic antidepressants there, um, and here we have the insights. But um, yeah, so we, 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 we actually tested loads of drugs. Um, we used to just go to the drug cabinet on a Friday and, and just start screening. You know, it was a Friday afternoon experiment. We'd start to screen, you know, maybe a dozen drugs on a, on a Friday, and we would do this over several weeks just to see uh, where we could go. And what we actually found was some really interesting results around the NSAID. So these are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that inhibit COX enzymes to inhibit the production of prostaglandins. And so they're already anti-inflammatory. It already just so happens that these guys are anti-inflammatory through the prostaglandin pathway. However, the prostaglandin pathway doesn't seem to be that important in Alzheimer's disease. There's already been uh, several clinical trials on these drugs that inhibit prostaglandins um, and they've been shown to not affect Alzheimer's disease progression. So do uh, a couple of them though, however, that haven't really been thoroughly tested in Alzheimer's disease do they also inhibit NLRP3? So essentially, um, we know non-steroidal anti-inflammatories do this. They inhibit the production of prostaglandins. Do they also inhibit the release of interleukin-1-beta, the inflammatory cytokine? That's what we were doing. So here's how we did the drug screen. And these were done in 96 well plates. So you could you could test 96, but normally, um, because to allow for standards and all this kind of stuff, we would normally test 80 different drugs. And we might actually do multiple doses. So we might actually test 20 drugs at four different concentrations in a plate on a given experiment. Maybe a little bit less if we wanted to do five different concentrations, for example. This is roughly how we did it. We plated up macrophages. So even though these are microglia, they have very similar NLRP3 uh, responses. And so it, it's a much easier and higher throughput to do experiment using macrophages and then go on and validate them in microglia. So we took macrophages, we treated them with lipopolysaccharide, LPS, that's a bacterial toxin, it activates the TLR4 receptor, so we know we're going to induce the expression of pro-interleukin-1-beta and NLRP3. We then treated them with ATP, so this is extracellular ATP, ATP shouldn't be in the extracellular space, and so this is modeling a damage-associated molecular pattern, ATP. And then we would give it either an hour or four hours, depending on the stimulant, sometimes two hours. Um, we would measure the interleukin-1-beta coming off. And so in this way, we could screen a lot of drugs. It's not really in an Alzheimer's um, relevant, it's not really uh, Alzheimer's specific, this model, but we're just looking for some generic NLRP3 activators and seeing if we can inhibit the NLRP3 inflammasome. So then we could test a large number of drugs. Now, ATP binds to this receptor called P2X7 on the surface of these macrophages, which opens up a pore, which allows potassium efflux. There you can see the potassium leaving. 
Um, and this, as we can see over here, potassium reflux is a major trigger of NLRP3 um, activation. So if we activate a receptor called P2X7 with ATP, we will cause potassium efflux. Now you can see that this is a fantastic thing for an immune cell to be able to do. If this is a macrophage and this is a regular tissue cell, and let's say this tissue cell gets infected with a virus, and this is a lysis virus, so eventually the cell fills up with viral particles and explodes, it's now going to release its ATP at very high concentrations. Now ATP is not normally outside the cell, so now the ATP is going to be Instead of being inside the cell, it's outside the cell, and it can act as a damage-associated molecular pattern, triggering interleukin one beta release from this uh, macrophage right beside it, using its P2X7 receptors. So it's a very clever technique. Excellent way to do a drug screen. And so this is from figure one in that paper. Here we've got uh, silicoxib. These are all uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Here's ibuprofen. Here's diclofenac. Here's flufenamic acid meclofenamic acid and mephenamic acid and they're all given at different concentrations and we've got IL-1 beta release and it's expressed as a percentage of control or a percentage of zero drug um, being uh, applied and so basically if it ever drops reasonably below this 100% dotted line that means we've got some level of inhibition so you can see diclofenac does some inhibition but really these are the stars flufenamic acid meclofenamic acid and mephenamic acid are all exceptional um, at inhibiting the CNLRP3 we were very excited at the 50 micromolar mark we would have liked it at lower concentrations, but 50 micromolar is actually clinically relevant. Um, it, it gets up to around about 75 micromolar in the blood after you take these drugs. Okay. So um, next you can look at the chemical structures and see that meclofenamic acid, diclofenac, and flufenamic acid all have similar structures. They have these two rings here joined by a nitrogen molecule, um, and ibuprofen that's structurally dissimilar had no effect on NLRP3. Very cool. So it's suggesting that there's something unique going on, and this uh, effect must be separate from the COX enzymes and the prostaglandins, because ibuprofen also inhibits the COX enzymes. The mechanism of action, how these drugs are working, can't be COX dependent, which is very, very interesting. Okay, now there are a lot of pathways to activate the inflam inflammasome. I've just got a few of them here. So reactive oxygen species and uh, phagolysosomal rupture, and there's a few receptors on the cell that can uh, um, all lead to NLRP3 inflammasome activation. So an important question is, we know that it inhibits ATP, which goes through the P2X7. We know that these drugs inhibit this pathway, but perhaps they're just inhibiting the P2X7 receptor. So why don't we look at a different pathway just to check to make sure that it's an inflammasome inhibitor and not the P2X7 receptor inhibitor. So that's what we do, and we actually look at crystals that look just like this, um, and so that's the next experiment that we jumped into. And for this, we use these things called urate crystals. Now, this is actually a, a segment of tissue from someone with gout, and in gout, perhaps their kidneys aren't working very well, perhaps they have a high nitrogen uh, diet, and they get too much uric acid building up in their blood, and the uric acid starts to crystallize. It's a little like if you put too much sugar in water, eventually the, uh, the sugar will start to crystallize lies at the bottom of the dish essentially there's a maximum concentration before you start to get crystallization and these crystals look extra cool because they do funky things under polarized light so this is the tissue is viewed under polarized light so you can see yellow and blue crystals and these are uric acid crystals these are all immune cells they look a bit funny because they are oh, the polarized light but you can definitely see the multi lobes of the neutrophils you can even see some monocytes that may have tried to phagocytose some uric acid crystals so we're going to do the same model we're going to take the macrophages give them lps and then we're going to give them urate crystals to see if that will activate the inflammasome I mean, we know it will activate the inflammasome. We'll see if we can inhibit it with our drugs. So again, we've got 100% release, which is no drug. Here's flufenamic acid, which only has 20%. So we've reduced it by 80% the amount of IL-1 beta coming out. And here we have ibuprofen, which has done nothing. That's not statistically significant. So now we can show that, yes, it's actually inhibiting multiple different activation pathways for NLRP3. So yes, it inhibits particulates. Now this strongly points to it being an inflammasome inhibitor rather than just inhibiting specific receptors that do eventually lead to inflammasome activation. So awesome, now we know that flufenamic acid and these other NSAIDs are inhibiting the inflammasome. But do they inhibit 
all inflammasomes. So there are actually multiple inflammasomes. I think there's up to 11 now. Um, and here's just a few of the examples here. So here's our boy here, the NLRP3 inflammasome, and it's got all these uh, activators here. Uric acid, alum is a thing that we put in vaccines, which does a very similar thing to uric acid and ATP and pore forming toxins. They all activate the NLRP3. But there's AIM2. Now, AIM2 directly binds to DNA, but that DNA has to be in the cytosol. You should never have DNA in your cytosol. So it's a sign that you've got probably a viral infection that has a DNA genome. And so this has been designed to bind to the DNA and activate in response to cytosolic DNA. And over here we've got NLRC4. Now this responds to flagellin, the famous spiral corkscrew-like tail on bacteria. So you can see that this one's largely a bacterial inflammasome, this one's largely a viral inflammasome, and a lot of these are sterile damage. So uric acid, ATP, and alum are all sterile damage, but poor form some bacteria do produce poor forming toxins. And so it is also involved in some bacterial infections. So do our NSAIDs or our non-steroidal anti-inflammatories also inhibit the other inflammasomes, or is it selective for the NLRP3? So once again, we take macrophages, we activate them with LPS, and then we either give them flagellin or we give them DNA to see if that, if that activates the inflammasomes and can we inhibit the IL-1 release in response to those stimuli. So here we have flagellin. Now it's got to get into the cytosol, so we have to actually transfect it, which sounds weird, but basically we put it in a little fat ball that will then fuse with the membrane and then you end up with flagellin in the cytosol. And you can see that we get IL-1 beta release um, and it's not blocked by flufenamic acid, methanamic acid or ibuprofen. And we did it again with DNA because that will activate the AIM-2 receptor and it was not blocked again by our drugs. So in other words, um, our drugs work on NLRP3 but they do not work on NLRC4 which is stimulated by flagellin or AIM-2 which is stimulated by DNA. Now you might notice there we do have this group here called YVAD um, which has inhibited IL-1 beta release in all of these and that's because that's a caspase 1 inhibitor. So if we know that NLRP3 pathway, the inflammasomes activate the caspase, which activates the interleukin 1 beta. Because all, all three of these inflammasomes activate caspase 1, if we block caspase 1, it should actually block all forms of IL-1 beta release, right? So we had this YVAD drug, and that's to confirm that we could inhibit the IL-1 beta. So this is just a positive control there. But very cool stuff. Now we know that we've got a selective NLRP3 inhibitor. Now that's actually good. You might go, hang on, isn't that bad? No, but if we want to give this drug to treat Alzheimer's disease, we don't want to block the receptors that are designed to detect bacteria or viral DNA. We only want to block the receptor that detects the amyloid. And that's because we don't want to open up our patients to infection. And indeed, there have been drugs that block the IL-1 signaling molecule from doing its signaling, and it did amazing things. It reduced cancer death by 50%, it reduced osteoarthritis and gout by 80%, and it reduced cardiovascular events by 50% because they are caused by cholesterol crystals and inflammation, partly caused by those things, um, which is all amazing. But unfortunately, we got a massive rise in infection because by inhibiting IL-1, you're actually inhibiting this pathway, flagellin, causing IL-1 beta release, or viral infections, cytosolic DNA causing IL-1 beta release. So by inhibiting IL-1 beta or caspase 1, you're opening your patient up to massive infection risk, but you're much less so, you are still a bit, but you're much less so if you're just inhibiting NLRP3. So this was actually super exciting and awesome news to have our drugs only inhibit the NLRP3 inflammasome. So that is all figure one from a four-figure paper and there are actually supplementary figures that I'm not going to go into um, but that is uh, figure one done and in the next video I'm going to cover figure two.